Welcome to IOTV's Insider. I'm Aaron Porras, and today, Israel is suffering from some deep-seated crises both across the political and social spheres. But Israeli Defense Minister Benny Gantz has a one-stone, two-bird solution for it all. A new IDF draft bill that would include the ultra-Orthodox and the Arab-Israeli communities in full. Joining us to discuss is former leader of the Zehut Party and founder of the Israeli Tomorrow Channel, Moshe Feiglin, and then Reserves Colonel Miri Eisen, former media advisor to two prime ministers and former senior uh, officer in IDF intelligence. Thank you both so much for being with us today. Uh, now, to begin, though, for those watching at home who don't know, army exemptions in Israel aren't new. They began in 1948 with a special waiver handed to just 400 yeshiva students, but taking advantage of the original decree, that number has now ballooned to well over 16% of the entire eligible ultra-Orthodox community. As for Arab Israelis and other minority groups, they were mostly given exemptions largely through cultural and political considerations. Still, the Supreme Court has since ruled that such exemptions are unconstitutional in Israel, and the deadline to pass a new law is fast approaching. Defense Minister Gantz then now calling for each and every citizen to give two years for the sake of unity, two years for the sake of society. Colonel Eisen, do you agree with Defense Minister Gantz that those who enlist are better integrated into society? I think they are, but I ask the question, does it need to be through the IDF? I think that you can get more integrated into society by doing what I would call national service. It doesn't have to be military service. The military itself is an action that really does change very much for Israelis, their position in society. But I wonder if the way to do so is to make everybody serve in the military, in uniform, in that type of hierarchy. Well, that being said, before I move on, and I kind of want to circle back to this, doesn't the IDF have a lot of non-combatant, non-military jobs? It certainly does, but we also have national service already today, which is used both by some quota of the religious women who rather than go into the military, go to national service. And we already have today Haredi, ultra-Orthodox men, a small number, but there is a number who are drafted into service. The question is if the military draft across the board needs to be for everybody in society, or can you call the draft something that is national, but not necessarily military. I see. Now, Moshe Feiglin, let's go to you. You've previously stated that a mandatory draft would be detrimental to Israel. Why is that? And do you still feel that way? I think the main question is that we should ask ourselves, first of all, is what's the purpose of that draft? It seems like we are loading that truck of the um, Military, military service with all kinds of uh, values that each side of society is trying to, you know, put into it. But uh, we forgot the main purpose. The main purpose of, of, of the army is to win the wars and to, and to give us uh, safe and, and security. That's the purpose. The purpose is not to, uh, uh, I don't know, have have people uh, give more to the society or less to the society. I think the concept that the, that the, that the state will tell people how to, uh, how to uh, uh, gig. P civilians should, should, should uh, you know, keep the law. <laughs> uh, uh, and that's it. And uh, let, let each, each, each individual decide uh, where, where he wants to, to give, to serve more and when he want, where he wants to serve less. The Haredim, I assume, believes that by, by learning Torah, they serve much more than uh, uh, civilian uh, service, Shehut Leumi, okay? You can argue with that, but that's their set of values and not you and not me will decide who's right and who's wrong. So that, so, so that being said, I mean, bouncing off of what Colonel Eisen said earlier, bouncing off of what Colonel Eisen said earlier, this, this harkens back to, uh, for me, the Kennedy quote, you know, ask, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And, and I think that a draft and a national service sort of falls in, in that route. In what way do you think that, you know, learning Torah and avoiding both national service and a draft fulfills that role. Is that role necessary? Well, I know another, 
another another American president that says that the, that the government is not the solution; the government is the problem, right? Yeah. So, and he was a Republican. The other, the other, uh, <laughs> the other uh, uh, president. President. Okay, talking about Ronald Reagan, of course. Yeah. So, you want to quote Kennedy? I'll, I will quote Reagan, and both of them are not my, uh, you know, aseret uh, adibot. Both of them. Uh, with, with all due respect, are not my uh, uh, words of God. Okay, it's, uh, it's it's very nice, and I don't think I'm loyal to the country and gave less to the country than any any anybody else. The point the point is really that when we're talking about the army, we should talk about security. We should should talk about defense. We should really uh, deal with the question, which, what is the best way to make the army function and protect us from our enemies? That's the question. And not how we use one thing, the concept of, of security or the ethos of security to force one on another a different behavior. Integrate, to me, according to my values, those who wants to live according to their values. And we should separate the discussion for, for, of both. Once we do, we do that, you'll be surprised to see, for example, that in 1948, that you quoted before, when, when we, oh, 49, when Ben-Gurion let only 400 uh, yeshiva bochers to, 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 to not, not to go to the army, at that same year, you know how many years each other 18-year-old uh, uh, 18, 18 people uh, uh, served, only two years in 48, where the army needed much more manpower, much, much more than today. And the, and, and the, uh, and the, uh, um, the threat was much bigger. Men served in the, in the IDF only two years. How come today it's almost three years when there's much less need for all this manpower? Obviously, the army is carrying on its back today a, a, a large sum of, 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 of weight, of, of fat that it doesn't need, and unfortunately harm the main course well, which is security. Well, so, we so now, we're, well, so now we're getting into now we're getting into other territory. And and, and Colonel Eisen, I'd like to bring you back in the, into this conversation. You know, do you agree with Mr. Feigland that that the army is bloated essentially? That aside from integration, uh, aside from the question of integration, that the army itself, to begin with, is too big. So Mr. Faglin said several different things, most of which I completely disagreed with. And I'm going to focus for the most on what the Army's mission is. And first of all, let's be clear with our terminology for our international audience. It's the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces. In Israel, we have, we have a tendency to call that Army. We're, of course, talking both about the Army and about the Navy and about the um, Air Force. It's just a question of terminology. In Israel, from 1948, we have had the draft, and there's been an exemption of two groups. And the question here is, why is the military service today longer than it was in 1949, by the way, not 1948? Mm -hmm. And two, is it too bloated? Those are two different questions. The military is not too bloated. It does not have enough people. It is the largest portion of the budget. And that's exactly because of what Mr. Feigling said that I did agree with, that what it needs to give is security. In the state of Israel, from the beginning of the state of Israel, from the enactment of the draft in June of 1948, a month after, really literally two weeks after the declaration of the state, I disagree with Mr. Fagling. It was part of the ethos in 1948. And the challenge that's happened 
is that the state of Israel has changed, the ethos has changed, and not about the question if it was needed at the time. In 1948, you had women combat fighters, and they stopped that too, Mr. Feiglin, and yet they brought it back in the last 25 years. It adapts. I think that the IDF is not bloated. It's a mirror of the portion of society that serve in it. The challenge that's happened, mainly over the last 30 years, and it's a challenge of numbers, but it's a challenge of the ideas of what's important to me as what's important to Mr. Feiglin inside Israeli society. You spoke before, Mr. Feiglin, about the law, the rule of law, laws in Israel. And the law in Israel is that you're supposed to be drafted. And the basic issue that's come up is that there are two portions of Israeli society that are not drafted. So that's against the law. So there's a question of, of how you adapt that law. And my idea is that you don't have to make them do military service. So do a different type of service for society. You want to do it for your portion of society, for the one that's important in your ethos. That's already part of the discussion. But but to overall say we need a military, it needs to be strong, um, but we're not going to have the draft, to me, is ludicrous. If you need a military and you need it to be strong, you need all of the portions of Israeli society. You don't just want the ones who are going to volunteer. And you can't just decide that the ones who get the draft are the ones who are educated to be part of that. You change it, you put in the education. I think that today, Haredi society is not homogeneous. They're not all against, just like they're not all for. And we need to look at it and see how we broaden our idea of society in Israel, both within the IDF and within the idea of national service. And I agree, we need to shorten the service, but that's not because of a gloat. It's not because of bloating. It's because at the end, it hurts our economy. We all want a strong mm. economy me. Three years of the draft is too long. Put it down to two. But those are totally different subjects as far as I'm concerned. Mr. Feiglin, your response? Well, well, uh, honestly, I also served a little bit in the Army and in the combat unit. As a combat unit. If you will ask me when I uh, was a commander in, in the field, if I'm willing to take now a bunch of uh, Haredim uh, uh, if, if I need them, the answer will be totally not. I definitely don't, don't need them. That will be just a headache for me. Why? And that's the answer. But why? That's the, that's the honest... Please let me. That's the honest answer that you're getting from a higher rank uh, commanders in the army today. The army don't need many of those well, that are being forced to serve today. Well, just, Mr. Feiglin, yeah, I, I, I'd like it if you can to explain why you wouldn't want the Haredim or the ultra-Orthodox in your unit, and to remind you that Defense Minister Gantz is the highest authority in, in the military right now, in the IDF, being the Defense Minister. And he, well, and he I, is I, I, the I one pushing this law. The, uh, the Gantz right now is, uh, is a politician, okay? But before and that, he was he, chief he of staff. Okay, so, uh, so if you would ask him then, you uh, uh, honestly, I'm sure you, you would have gotten that answer. And that answer was given by many uh, high rank commanders at the time. And again, I'm telling you, and I'm, te and I'm telling uh, uh, Mrs. Eisen, that, that um, you have to ask yourself, what is the goal over here? Is the goal here is security? If the answer is yes, you need today less uh, less uh, soldiers and more uh, professional work. The, the wars become much more technologi technological and needs much less people. Instead of that, you're taking people that can, can go out, of, out to work and contribute to the economy and force them to go either to the army to put another weight on the Israeli security needs, okay, on one hand, or go sit in a yeshiva when they are not learning. Some of them cannot, not, not everybody can learn, but they now they're forced to, okay, and, 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 and get a bad results from the other side. The real, and, and the fact that today this is the law is not an answer, Mrs. Eisen. The law, the law needs to be changed. For example, 
uh, if you're a pilot or if you're serving in Mishmar Agvul. So yes, you're a volunteer, but yet you're getting a good salary and you become a professional army and you serve as it should be. So, and, and, and by the way, that's the process that the army is going to anyhow it is not. I completely disagree with you. And I think that in that sense, the way that you're presenting it is one which certainly for our viewers is erroneous right now. What you're saying to me is, Miri, is those who are drafted are firim, as we would say in Hebrew. They're the suckers. And those who aren't drafted, they're in a position where it's not their fault because they don't want it. They could be drafted or else they have to go and study Torah. It's like those are these two options. And it's the state of Israel who's done so. But Mr. Feiglin, we both live in the state of Israel. We're both citizens of the state of Israel. Both of us did serve in the military. And the question is not looking backwards, it's looking forwards. What is that state of Israel? And here I listen to you and I disagree. Nobody in the military talks about a professional army. That only comes up from politicians. Nobody in the military talks about stopping the draft. You can have lots of things that you could do better with the draft. As I said, you could open it up for national service. You could see it as not just military, but the military is being a part of it. The question is the question that you raised. What kind of a country do you want to live in? How involved do you want society to be in? How do you want to have it here so that the yeshiva bachar who's there and doesn't want to be there is not imposed into going there? Because he could do national service instead. Why so, not offer that? What you're saying is, so what you're saying, excuse me for, for, for interrupting you, <laughs> you're in the middle of your speech. But what you're saying is, really, from your from your words, what, what everybody can hear is that we are going to use the army in order to integrate people. We're going to use the army to order to make, have people doing a national service. And if not, we're going to force, force on them a different national service. This is what you're saying. And, and, and this I, is what and, exists. And, and I believe this is also what you mean. And the difference between us is, is the very basic understanding of what states made for. Okay? What's the, what's the goal of the state? And the goal of the state, according to my understanding, is not to educate its people. I'll say it in a different way. For me, you see, we are not, we're not talking about security. We're talking about state of mind and understanding and understanding what the con what the concept of the of the modern state is all about. This is what we're talking about. Please, we're not talking about security over here, okay? Now, when we're talking about the real issue, okay, the question, what is the goal of the state? I believe, okay that you and I are the mothers and the fathers of the state, not the little kids of the state. The state belongs to us, not we belong to the state, okay? And, the, and, and what the state should give us is the security, okay? And the, and the equality in front of the law, and basically, that's it. I'm sure you're serving your, your, your country a lot, I'm sure you're giving whatever you can. Believe me, I'm also giving a little bit, but I don't want to force on you what you should give. And please don't use so, the, that mechanism or, or another to force on me your set of files. So, so conversely- And I understand yeah. that- No, go sorry. ahead, go ahead, Colonel. Um, I think in that sense, as I'm listening to that in these different, different, very different approaches, and I would say this isn't about separate value systems. It's very much about what is the state and what is the security and military inside the state. Oh, so for me, Mr. Feiglin, absolutely the reason that the state of Israel has had an immense military. The reason that we have managed as a military to do very unique actions in our being, in our defense, in all of the different wars and including in the challenging wars of today, the reason that we are top notch and we are inside the technology is because we have the draft, period. That is the reason we are different. 
So now what I'm trying, I'm asking you, if you don't have the draft, then the values and the morals of today's society, of every individual to himself, who is the one who is going to go and be in the security? When you have the draft, you have the commitment to that state to be able to secure the state of Israel, that you get the best and the brightest and the, the jocks and the sportsmen and the technologues, all of them come in for two years in Israeli society. And for two years, I absolutely as a value think that they come and do something not not for themselves, but rather for the state and society that they live in. And through that prism of the IDF, that's where we were in the past. It's where we are right now, but not. And I think that we need to look at how we do it in the future. But that doesn't mean canceling the draft. You want the best IDF in the world. And you get that through the draft. Okay. And uh, I can just add to what you're saying, Mrs. Eisen that uh, the, uh, when you go pilot, for example, okay, are not forced to be pilot. They volunteer. Um, uh, when, when they, uh, uh, as, as, as I mentioned before, are not forced, they, are, they volunteer. Parachuters are volunteer. They stand on line, okay, uh, uh, many of them don't go through in order to get to these units, okay? Now, when you have a professional army that will give much better salaries and much and much better uh, um, uh, training and, and, and the rest of it, and when, when, when with the civilian society will, pick, will keep on looking at these pilots and these parachuters the way it looks today, you think you'll have and, and they'll have uh, academy schools for free and so on. Do you think you'll have less volunteers or more volunteers? And besides that, I'm not saying that there'll be no draft. There will be draft for everybody, including Haredim, for less than one month. They'll have a very basic training, okay, and they'll go home. In case of a major war, you'll be able to get those people to help you, you know, to help the, the fighting forces just as before. But the core of the army will become professional. And that uh, uh, dividing issue between Haredim and, and non Haredim, that divide the country for 70 years, will be behind of us. The bottom line will be that we'll have much better security and much better, better free uh, and, and better uh, society. Uh, I absolutely disagree with you. I think that that is a vision not of the modern state of Israel. It's one that exempts portions of society. It is not one which is looking at society as a whole. It is not one that looks at the values of liberty and democracy in the sense of equality. But those would be my opinions as opposed to yours. All right. I think exactly. with that, with exactly. that, with exactly. a, with exactly. a, with a exactly. agreeing... Exactly. Well, Thank you. I, I think with it's that, really unfortunately, really we have to agree to disagree. Uh, but that is all the time that we have today. Thank you again, no, Colonel no, Miri Eisen. Uh, we, we, and thank you thank again. Thank you so much, Aaron. Thank, thank you, you again, Mr. Feiglin. Moishe Feiglin, thank you, you very you much. And thank you, you, Colonel Eisen, for joining us. Tune in next time, everybody watching, for more Insider on, uh, on ILTV and for more in-depth analysis on everything Israel. Also, if there's a topic that you want us to cover next, please let us know about it in the comments sections online. And remember that for more news from Israel, follow ILTV on Facebook, like us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channels. I'm Aaron Porras. Thank you again for watching.